Good evening, everybody. My name is Sue. I'm a program assistant here at the Elmhurst Public Li Library. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Just a few things to get through before the program starts. Uh, tonight, we are using a hybrid format. And that's, so that means that we do have attendees both here in person and uh, on a device. If you are watching from a device, we are using the webinar format, and that means you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. Uh, for if we're, um, I don't think we're doing a question. We don't usually do questions. <laughs> um, so if you are watching on Zoom, I have enabled the live transcript option. If you would like to disable the words at the bottom of your screen, click on the closed captioning button. If you do not see the button with CC, click on more or the button with the three dots and then select hide subtitles. In the library, we are using our assisted listening system. If you would like to borrow one of these devices, just come see me in the back of the room. They're very easy to use. Please silence all cell phones and any other devices. If you need to take a call, please step outside of the room to do so. Bathrooms are located down the hallway near the parking lot entrance on your left. Uh, and if you need to leave the room at any point during the presentation, please do so without disturbing your neighbors and make sure to check the door closes behind you. The program this evening is being recorded. Anybody who uh, registered for the program will receive a link to uh, a YouTube video. And just really quick, just a program I'd like to tell you about coming up on March 28th, that's Monday. Uh, if you are here tonight to see Green Man Theater and um, about stories about the stars, you would like to come to Astrology 101 at 7 p.m. Learn about sun signs, moon signs, and rising signs. Come and join us and find out some more about that. If you are on a device, I will be sharing the links to those programs, both in person and virtual. And now please help me in welcoming Carolyn from the Green Man Theater. Thank you and welcome. We are Green Man Theater Storytellers and we are here to tell you a program of celestial stories. These are going to be about the sun, the moon, the stars, and the zodiac. The library asked us to cover all of the signs of the zodiac, so we're going to do that. And if you find that you have any questions about this, the library has some wonderful books, so please go check them out. And now, enjoy our celestial stories. Thank you. Human beings have been gazing up at the night sky in wonder since we first gazed up. But the sky has more to offer than simply wonder. It's a source of information that we want. For instance, in ancient Egypt, when is the Nile River going to flood? Or later, when should I plant these crops? Or when is Easter? Or a basic question of all, I don't want to get lost out here. Which way's north? The poet Walt Whitman captured these two aspects of the sky in his poem, when I heard the learned astronomer. And he's not shy about making clear which he prefers. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs and figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself and in the mystical moist night air looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Among the charts and diagrams the astronomer was no doubt showing were charts and diagrams of the constellations. And in particular, that band of constellations through which the sun, moon, and planets appear to move, the zodiac. 
so-called because most of these constellations are animals, or at least other living things. The first of these zodiac constellations is Aries the Ram. Aries is the second smallest zodiac constellation. It's about the size and curved shape of the handle of the Big Dipper. And it's located in the sky just west of the Pleiades. It's best seen between November and January. And the best place is not in Elmhurst. Other than its brightest star, the stars of Aries are too faint to be seen around here, except under the very best conditions. Now, Aries the Ram is a very old constellation. It was known to the Romans, the Greeks, and the ancient Babylonians. And it is featured in multiple mythological tales. Not only is the ram itself featured in one story, but its fleece, the golden fleece, was the goal of the famous quest of Jason and the Argonauts. Many, many years ago, the king of Thebes grew bored with his wife and married another. The new queen was very jealous and hated the king's children by his first wife, the boy Phrixus and the girl Helle, and plotted to have them put to death. They were on the point of being killed when a ram swooped in, picked them up, and carried them off far to the east. As they crossed into Asia, Helle, the girl, fell off and landed in a strait of water that was renamed the Hellespont in her honor. Phrixus managed to hang on until they reached the kingdom of Colchis on the eastern shore of the Black Sea. There, in thanks, he sacrificed the ram to Zeus, who put the ram in the heavens, and presented the ram's fleece, which had turned to gold, to the king of Colchis, who hung it in a sacred grove guarded by a dragon. Years later, Jason was challenged to find the golden fleece and bring it back. He assembled the Argonauts and, with a lot of help, succeeded in his quest. Now, his tale of full of adventures, betrayals, and grisly murders is more than I can get into here. But the Elmhurst Library has many good books on mythology and they can give you all the details. Now, earlier I mentioned that Aries was the first of the zodiac signs. And if you look at a horoscope in the newspaper someplace, you'll see Aries is always listed first. And the reason for this goes back to ancient times. We know that the earth spins on its axis like a top, but it also wobbles like a top. And what is now the North Star wasn't always the North Star. And in particular for our discussion, the point in the sky where the sun crosses the equator going north, that is to say, the vernal equinox, the beginning of spring, and the start of the new year for many ancient cultures has also moved over time. 3,000 years ago, that point was in the constellation Aries, but it moves. And astronomically speaking, since about 68 BC, that point has moved into the constellation Pisces. But we still start with Aries. In a couple of hundred years, that point will move into the constellation 
Aquarius, at which point the age of Aquarius will finally begin. Taurus the bull is the second sign of the zodiac. Originally falling between April 20th to May 20th, the newer official dates for Taurus are now May 13th to June 21st. Near the constellation of the bull, you will find Orion and Orion's belt, which continues on to an open cluster of stars called the Pleiades, more commonly called the Seven Sisters, that relate directly to the Greek mythology of the bull. In Greek mythology, the constellation of the bull was placed up in the heavens by Zeus, almost as a way to boast of his conquest of a young maiden, Europa, which succeeded when Zeus took the form of a snow white bull. When I was in the third grade, my mother went back to college and I was very proud of her for doing this. And I also enjoyed hearing her talk about her classes. And my favorite class that she took was one about folklore. She told us about different stories from different cultures, but the ones that I liked the best were stories about the Hoja. He was from Turkey and he was a very wise man except when he wasn't, and he was very, very foolish. These are wonderful tales. Um, some of the themes are similar to tales from other countries, but I like these stories so much, and my mother told me that her professor had a little pamphlet that he had gotten from the Turkish embassy in Washington, D.C. when he had visited there, and so my mother suggested that I, as I was learning both cursive and how to write a business letter, in third grade, could write to the Turkish embassy in Washington, D.C. and ask them if they would send me one of these pamphlets. So I did. And I went to the mailbox every day to check to see if I was getting a letter from the Turkish embassy in Washington, D.C. And at last, something came and it wasn't a letter, it was a package. And in the package was this book. This is the very book that they sent me, not a pamphlet, but an entire book. And inside here is a little engraved piece of paper that says, with the compliments of the Turkish embassy. So today, I would like to share with you a story by the Hoja. Actually, it's a story about the Hoja. It's about when the Hoja rescued the moon. One night, the Hoja was sitting by the lamplight reading some of his sacred texts. He was beginning to get rather sleepy, and so we thought it would be very nice if his wife would bring him a drink of water. So he called to her, Fatima! He looked to the kitchen, the kitchen was dark. Fatima must have gone to bed, he thought. I shall have to get a drink of water for myself. So we toddled off to the kitchen, he picked up the water jug, and it was empty. Well, I will have to go fill up the water jug by myself too, he thought. He went out into the courtyard. Oh, it was a beautiful night and the smell of jasmine and gardenia filled the air. He went to the well in the center of the courtyard. He pulled off the cover, he picked up the bucket and he looked into the well. Fatima, come quickly, he called, the moon has fallen into the well. But Fatima must have been fast asleep because she did not come. <sighs> well, I shall have to figure this out by myself. I shall have to save the moon. What am I going to do? I must keep my head. I must be brave. I must be clever. If I can rescue the moon from drowning in my well, I will be remembered forever as a mighty hero. What do I do? Oh, I need a stick or, or a, a rod or something. And he whirled around and then he, he discovered that his pantaloons were caught on something. So he reached down and, oh, it was the hook. 
that you put the bucket on to put into the well. I can use this to rescue the moon. So he wrapped the rope around his other hand. He lowered the hook into the well. And as he trolled the hook across the surface of the water, he called, moon, moon, grab on with all your might, and I will save you. And just then, the hook caught on a rock on the side of the well. Oh, good moon, said the Hoja. On the count of three, jump as high as you can. So the Hoja called, one. And he pulled with all of his might. Two. And he pulled with even more of all of his might. And three. And he pulled with the strength of the strongest ox. And at that moment, the rock came loose and it flew up into the air and the Hoja fell backwards onto the ground. He lay there for a moment or two, dazed. But when he opened his eyes, what did he see? But the moon shining down in all her splendor. She was back in her place in the sky. Oh, I have saved the moon, said the Hoja, with my cleverness and my brute strength. <laughs> So he filled up the water jug. He went back to the kitchen. He poured himself a nice cup of water. He took a drink, and then he went off and put himself to bed. And as he lay there, rubbing the back of his head, which had a little bit of a bump, but what does that matter when one has saved the moon? As the moon went across the sky, it came, the light from the moon came in the window, and the Hoja just basked in her that wonderful glow, and he absorbed it with every pore of his being and felt very proud of himself. And that is the story of how the Hoja saved the moon. Now, I should tell you that this is a common theme in, in many cultures. There's a Chinese story about monkeys who are trying to rescue the moon who keep holding each other and until they have this whole chain of monkeys and trying to get the moon out of the water. And there's another story about the three sillies who see the moon in the water. And there's also a lovely picture book about a kitten who sees the moon and thinks that it's a bowl of milk. So check out all those stories here at the Elmhurst Library. Thank you. I am a twin, and I would like to tell you about my favorite constellation in the sky. You guess it, Gemini. Gemini is the on the zodiac from the dates March. I'm sorry, May 21st through June 20th. The constellation appears in the sky uh, in the northern hemisphere during the winter months, and its two most prominent stars are Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux in ancient mythology have a very interesting history. Zeus seduced the lovely Leda, and out of their union came four children, two of which are Castor and Pollux. The twins became inseparable as they aged and went on many adventures together. Castor was a renowned boxer, and Pollux was an accomplished horseman. On one of their adventures, on several of their adventures, they went sailing together, including with the Argonauts, and on one stormy night, the sailors fell to the deck in despair for fear that their ship would break up in the storm. But Castor and Pollux remained calm. They prayed to their immortal deities for safety. After their prayers, the storm dissipated and the sea returned to calm. The sailors were amazed and spread the word of how Castor and Pollux, the twins, remained unflappable in this, in this uh an insane storm and the the twins became a beacon of reassurance for sailors legend has it that if you see two balls of light on the masthead during a fierce storm castor and pollux are there protecting your ship zeus learned of the strength of the sailors uh, of the twins and upon their ascent to heavens put castor and pollux in the sky together to continue to serve as reassuring uh, uh, signs for their uh, sailors. I'd like to tell you now about a tale from Africa in the southern hemisphere. Year round, 
you can see a cluster of stars known as crux. This cluster of stars um, goes by several names. Some see a pride of lions. Others see the Southern Cross, as many of us know it. But the Tatwa people of Africa see a giraffe. Let me tell you about the giraffe. Many, many generations ago, when the earth was still young, the sky rested on, a, on the earth's surface, and it was just a gray blue rock. The sun traveled across the sky during the day, and the stars twinkled through holes in the rock at night. Every animal, big and small, had a job to do. The lions with their claws and teeth guarded. The elephants with their strength moved logs. But the giraffe had no task to do. She was so tall and clumsy. She spent her days mournfully looking at the sky. Her friends racked their brains and worked together to come up with a task, and they had it. The giraffe being so tall would be perfect to help the sun. You see, the sun traveled across the sky from day, but all, often would get lost and bumble to and fro, veering off course. The giraffe could lift her tall head, her, her tall neck into the, into the clouds and watch. And if the sun ever veered off course, she could reach out her long purple tongue and nudge the sun back into place. The giraffe did this job so consistently and so faithfully that she was given a special honor. Several stars were rearranged to form an arrow pointing to the sun. This is known as Tatwa or giraffe. And the Bushmen of Africa follow Tatwa to this day to guide their way at night. This story reminds me that every individual can use their unique talents to help the earth and help the world become a better place. Thank you. Cancer, also known as the crab, is the fourth sign of the zodiac. The traditional dates for cancer are June 21st to July 2nd, but the adjusted dates now fall between July 20th to August 10th. Around the area of cancer, you will find many constellations which coincide with the Greek stories of how that constellation came to be. Near it, you're going to find Leo the lion, Hydra, and the kneeler. In classical times, the beginning of cancer started on the summer solstice and was known as the Tropic of Cancer. But with the shifting of the zodiac signs, it is now believed that the summer solstice actually falls at the very end of the sign Gemini instead. In Greek mythology, it is believed that the crab was placed up in the stars by Hera, the wife of Zeus. The crab had attacked Hercules as he was accomplishing his second of 12 labors, but Hercules stomped on it, ending the creature's life. Hera placed the crab high up in the stars in gratitude for its attempt to help her vanquish Hercules. And while the crab can be killed in Greek mythology, the Egyptians, on the other hand, knew cancer as a scarab which is a sacred symbol of immortality. I'm going to tell a story about an island called Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, they practiced Buddhism and they were great storytellers. These storytellers love to talk about the moon, especially it was one of their favorites. And this story comes from that. Once long ago, there was a, a gleam of moonlight shining into the clearing of a forest. A small brown rabbit, who had long since young had left the nest, sat all alone by a rock, nibbling on a slight piece of bark. Suddenly, her, her ears perked up. A man stumbled into the clearing and lay where he had fallen. The rabbit sniffed the air, then hopped a little closer. The man's eyes were fixed on the rabbit's every movement. 
you are ill and tired, said the rabbit. I am very tired, my friend. The rabbit hopped closer. Put your hand on my fur, she said. The man laid his thin hand on the back of the rabbit. The rabbit could immediately feel the man's kindness. She had no idea the man was the Buddha. You have lost your way, she asked. I have lost my way. Would you like me to help you find your way to the clearing, asked the rabbit. I have no money to pay you, said the man. The rabbit bowed low. Your debt would be mine if you would walk and talk with me, she said. The man slowly got up and the rabbit and the man walked and talked through the deepest part of the forest until they got to an open plain and the moon shone brilliantly over the both of them. The rabbit looked at the man kindly and said, you, you must be very hungry. I am famished, said the man. The rabbit said, there is not much food for a man such as you in this forest. Let me be your meal. I could gather some firewood and make you a fire and you could cook me for dinner. Without letting the man protest, the rabbit zigzagged all around the forest, gathering branches and making a huge fire with yellow world flames roaring up high into the sky. And when it was finished, the rabbit bowed low again and said, you have been a great friend to me. Thank you for your kindness. And the rabbit leaped into the flames, at which moment the Buddha reached out his hand, grabbed the rabbit by her velvet ears, and swung her once, twice, and high up into the sky flew the rabbit. And she could feel herself whirling, the fur, fur flying, her paws outstretched. And down below, she could hear the Buddha saying, <clears throat> a friend like you shall never die for you have given me something like love and friendship and hope, and you should go to the moon and show all the people your love and kindness. And to this day, the rabbit can be seen her form in the moon, and she is there for all the kindness and hope and love for the lost and lonely travelers to this day. <clears throat> These were the, not all, one of the only moon stories. You've all heard about the man in the moon. There's been cartoons and jokes and all sorts of stories. And the rabbit in the moon was one of these stories we just told now, but there's another one. The rabbit had a friend on the moon. Not a dog, not a cat, but a queen, a queen from China, no less. Queen Chano, and this is her story. A long time ago, there was an evil emperor. He called his army together. He said, you will go out and you will find all the potions, all the herbs, all the medicines. I want life immortal and you will find it. Do whatever you need to do. But the emperor's wife, Queen Chano said, oh, but, but my, my Lord, you must be wise. No man lives forever. Oh, wise. What is good is wise if I'm dead? So he sent his armies out. There was killing, pillaging, raging for these simple things, for herbs and all the elixirs. The king insisted. Finally, the queen said, what is the price you shall pay? When, what does your heart say? He says, immortality at every price. One night, the queen was alone in her room crying and sobbing when a goddess appeared named Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin brought with her a bottle, an elixir. Kuan Yin told Chan Oh, this is the elixir of immortality. Kuan Yin gave the elixir to Chan Oh. Chan Oh says, if I give this to my husband, maybe he will be happy. So Kuan Yin went to her husband, the emperor, and said, this is life, this is the life of immortality. Instead of taking it and thanking her, he screamed at her, give it to me now. 
at which time Chan Oh said, no, not you or any tyrant will ever have immortality. Chan Oh opened the bottle of elixir, drank it herself, and jumped out the window. Did she fall down? No. She went up into the sky. Her life became immortal. She did not die. As she was going up, up, up into the sky, suddenly she changed into a three-legged frog. But why? Someone had put a very evil curse on this, thinking the emperor would be drinking it. Now, Chen o was a three-legged frog on her way to the moon. When she reached the moon, Chen o, the three-legged frog, met the rabbit on the moon. They were instant friends. The rabbit on the moon sat next to the frog on the moon on a nice and shiny, brilliant, silvery log, happy as anyone can be. Down on earth, we have an emperor, very mortal, you see, cursing the people on the moon. But you see, Chan O, who was the frog of three, she saved the secret of immortality. And that's the story of Rabbit and the Frog on the Moon. Okay. <clears throat> the adventures of Hercules are responsible for many of our Zodiac stories, and Leo is one of them. First of all, the facts. Leo is the fifth zodiac sign in the sky. The dates run from July 23rd to August 22nd, and his neighbors are Cancer and Virgo. And here is the story behind Leo. Hercules was the son of Zeus by one of his many mistresses. So therefore Hera, who was married to Zeus, hated Hercules. Now it just so happened that Hera had raised and trained a fantastical beast called the Nemean lion. But this lion was running amok. It was ravaging the countryside and it was devouring entire herds of livestock. Somebody had to stop this beast. And this became Hercules' first task of his famous 12 labors. Well, first, to slay the lion, Hercules tried to kill it with arrows and spears, but the metal would not penetrate the lion's thick skin. Then Hercules decided to bash in the, the animal's skull and try and dash its brains out, but the lion was so strong that the blows to the head just made it angrier and made the fight more difficult. Finally, Hercules managed to strangle the life out of the lion. And when the lion was dead, Hercules took the lion's own claws and skinned it because the lion's claws were the only substance strong enough to cut through that lion's pelt. Ever since that day, that uh, lion's pelt has been Hercules' most treasured possession and his trademark. As for Hera, in her sorrow, she decided to set an image of the lion in the sky. And we think of it as the constellation of Leo. Look up at the night sky and find the handle of the Big Dipper. Now, follow the arc to Arcturus and drive a spike to Spica. There you will find Virgo, the second largest constellation in the night sky and the sixth constellation of the Zodiac. Lying between Leo and Libra, Virgo historically occurred between August 23rd to September 22nd but now it's adjusted dates are about September 16th to October 30th. Depicted as a maiden with wings holding an ear of wheat, Virgo may be disappointing to the naked eye because Spica is her only bright star, but the deep sky objects found within that form the group of galaxies known as the Virgo cluster are what make this constellation so unique. 
and her origins are just as varied among countries. In Egypt, they knew Virgo as Isis, goddess of fertility, magic, and motherhood. Her husband, Osiris, was once killed by Set, and Isis went and got his body and brought him back from the dead so that she could conceive Horus. This action linked Isis to the resurrection of Osiris, which brought fertility to the land and redefined Virgo as the goddess of agriculture, protecting the harvest she created when she strayed grain across the Milky Way sky. The Babylonians know Virgo as Ishtar, the great harlot or goddess of procreation. Ishtar was a woman of immense sexual power and led a cult of sacred prostitution, which ensured fertility in the land. When her husband, King Thamus, the god of the harvest, was kidnapped by King Winter and carted off to Hades, Ishtar went down to Hades to rescue him, only to be trapped there herself. Some Greek mythology believes Virgo to be Demeter, the harvest goddess or goddess of the earth. Demeter's daughter, Persephone, was once kidnapped by Hades, god of the underworld, and dragged down into his kingdom to become his wife. And Demeter, overcome with grief from the loss of her daughter, gave up her duty as earth goddess and went to search for Persephone instead. Well, the world suffered from this. Cold, harsh winds froze some parts of the land while hot, scorching summer heat dried up other areas and soon there was nothing left but drought, disease, pestilence, and death. And humanity would have perished, but Zeus stepped in. Zeus ordered Hades to return Persephone to her mother, but warned Persephone not to eat anything until she got home. Hades was a clever god, and he gave Persephone a pomegranate as a parting gift. And on her way home, she sucked on four of the pomegranate seeds. As punishment for disobeying him, Zeus decreed Persephone must now spend four months of every year down in the underworld with Hades. And during these four months, Demeter pines for her daughter and cannot attend her godly duties. But every year, when Persephone comes home, spring returns to the earth. During those four months, winter reigns. Now, an alternate story in Greek mythology, one that links Virgo to the other signs, is that Virgo is actually Astraea, the star maiden, the goddess of peace, purity, benevolence, and justice. Astraea was the caretaker of humanity and lived on earth in the golden age. Representing natural law, she encouraged humans to live with nature, which they did until Pandora's box was opened. Over time, humanity became more and more wicked and sinful, and one by one, the gods fled the earth, but Astraea stayed behind until at last she realized humans were no longer upholding justice as they once had, and she grew tired of caring for a humanity that was determined to destroy itself. So she rose up into the sky to become the constellation of Virgo. And the scales of justice she once held, she turned over to her neighboring constellation of Libra. It is said, when the golden age returns, Astraea will return to the earth again. story you will hear from me <laughs> tonight is a folk tale that actually comes from India. The brightest star in the night sky is Sirius, the dog star. This is the star that marked the flooding of the Nile River in ancient Egypt each year and the hottest dog days of summer in ancient Greece. In ancient India, it is known as Svana, a dog sent by the gods to test the kindness of a king. For many years, King Yudhisthira ruled his kingdom wisely and well. He was skilled in leadership and loved by all his people. 
but long years of torture, war, and loss had taken their toll on the king, and he felt old and worn. His attachment to life was no longer great. His four younger brothers, who had suffered through those same wars, felt the way. So together they decided that the time had come for them to leave this worldly life and make their way up to heaven, high among the snow-capped tips of the Himalayan mountains. King Yudhisthira turned his throne over to his grandson, and after a grand coronation, the brothers bid farewell and prepared to leave the kingdom. Barefoot and clothed in humble robes of white, the brothers set off for their last and greatest journey. By the time they reached the foot of the Himalayan mountains, a small little brown dog had joined them, trotting along merrily at their sides. No one knew where the dog had come from, but it followed faithfully, never leaving Yudhisthira's side. The brothers named the dog Svana and returned its devotion tenfold. As they climbed up the mountain higher and higher, the trek became harder and harder. The slope was steep. The air was thin and the brothers were old their bodies weak. One by one, they began to fall by the wayside and die, until at last only the former king, Yudhisthira, was left. Gathering up his strength, he trudged on, climbing higher, alone now, except for his loyal brown dog. When the two companions at last reached the rooftop of the world, what he saw took Yudhisthira's breath away. All around him were snowy summits and sun-struck ridges. Far below, rushing rivers in shadowy valleys glinted in the sunlight. And into this snow-bright landscape, there rode a figure shining with an even more brilliant light. This figure was Lord Indra, king of heaven, riding along in his chariot, dazzling and sparkling, decked out in diamonds and pearls. He pulled up next to Yudhisthira. Good Yudhisthira, he said. What has taken you so long? I have been waiting for you to arrive. Forgive me, my lord, replied Yudhisthira. I am on my way, but I am old and slow. Come, climb aboard my chariot. I shall take you to heaven myself. Yudhisthira felt nothing but relief at this. The journey had been a long one and very difficult, and he was exhausted. So Yudhisthira started to climb into Lord Indra's chariot, and as he did, the little dog hopped up and sat down next to, us, next to him. No, cried Lord Indra, not the dog. There is no room in heaven for a dog. Heartbroken at this, Yudhisthira replied, My lord, if there is no room in heaven for a dog, then there is no room for me either. You see, this dog has been my true and faithful companion. And when everyone else was lost, he stayed. I will not abandon him now. So Yudhisthira started to climb down out of the chariot. And as he looked around to call for Svana, the dog was nowhere to be found. Smiling down at the puzzled king, Lord Indra explained, that little dog was your father, Lord Dharma, sent to test your kindness, and you have passed with flying colors. Goodness lies in the humblest of actions as well as the mightiest. Come, it is time to go. So Yudhisthira climbed aboard Lord Indra's chariot and together the two sailed off into the sky towards heaven. And Svana, that faithful little dog, was honored with a special place high among the stars. 
And that is the tale of the dog in heaven. Libra is the seventh sign of the zodiac, and it is the only constellation of the zodiac that is not based on either a person or an animal. Nowadays, people see it as a set of scales in balance and as a symbol of harmony and justice. This concept made more sense back in Babylonian times when the autumnal equinox when days and nights are equal of our equal length happen during Libra's astrological dates which are September 23rd to October 22nd now because the movement of the heavens the sun passes through Libra between October 31st and November 23rd which means that the autumnal equinox now happens during Virgo. After the Babylonians, the Greeks did interpret Libra as representing part of an animal. They saw the stars of Libra not as a separate constellation, but as the claws part of the scorpion in Scorpius. However, the Romans returned to identifying Libra with the scales and the balancing of the days and nights of the equinox. Libra is next to Virgo, the maiden. And so sometimes Virgo is identified as Astraca, the goddess of justice holding the scales. Now, according to a story from Africa, a long time ago, the sun and the bat were good friends. They were together all the time. They share their dreams as well as their problems. One day, the moon and the sun began talking about who was stronger. The moon said she was stronger. The sun did not agree with her. They argued, I am stronger said the moon. No, I am stronger, said the sun. No, I am, and so on. Finally, they decided to have a contest. After a couple of days, they planned to meet at the lake to see who could throw a rock the farthest across the lake. A lot of animals came from all over the world to the lake, to watch the contest. They came early because they knew that the contest could start at any time. The moon arrived at the lake first. She wanted to win. So she practiced before the sun arrived. She picked up rocks one at a time and threw them. Each time the rocks went farther and farther. By the time the sun finally arrived at the lake, the moon was sure that she could win. The moon chose a rock and threw it. It landed near the other side of the lake. The sun chose a bigger rock and threw it. Near the middle of the lake, the sun's rock began to fall for the uh, water, but all of a sudden, it began to go up again. The sun's rock went all the way to the other side of the lake. It seemed that the sun had won the contest after all. However, nobody knew that the bat was carrying the rock for his friend, the sun. When the bat was sure that no one could see him, he stopped to rest between a pair of banana trees. His wings were so tired. It was difficult 
carrying the heavy rock, but he was happy to help his friend the sun. That's what friends are for, thought the bat. Many years later, the bat's uh, mother died. He knew, of course, that according to custom, the body must be buried the same day of the death. Above all, the bat wanted uh, his mother to have a nice grave. The bat worked all day, but he was not finished by the time the sun began to go down. The bat asked for a favor from the sun. Can you stay up until I finish uh, my mother's grave? The sun refused. Again and again, the bat begged, please, please, my dear friend, I beg you, I beg you. But the sun said it was time for him to go down. The bat was very, very angry. The sun did not help him even though he had helped the sun. When the moon came up, she saw the bed still working hard on his mother's grave. The moon gladly gave the bed enough light to finish his work and honor his mother's death. As a result, the bed and the moon became best friends. That's why today you will never ever see the bat and the sun together. He is always with his friend, the moon. And that my friends, that's how the bat caught the friendship with the moon. Thank you. I have, a, oh, I have another uh, story about the moon for you. This is from uh, the Maya and Quiche myths of Guatemala. <clears throat> In the land of the wandering jaguar, the sacred deer, the soaring quetzal, the ant, the butterfly, beneath the jade mountain and beside the turquoise sea, in other words, in the land of the Mayan people, they say the moon is the most beautiful of all the heavenly bodies. People watch for hours just looking at that lustrous pearl, that white gardenia that can spill thousands, millions of petals upon the sea and yet remain in full bloom. The moon, they say, is a radiant queen who lives and breathes, laughs and cries, and they call her by her name, Ichel, Moon Woman. Ichel has everything a young queen needed, a beautiful palace, a lovely walled garden, and of course, a guardian who happened to be her grandfather. Ichal paddled the cosmic waters in her dugout canoe, surrounded by swirling eddies of stars. She watched over the tides of the great oceans, steadily guiding them in and out. And she was known to be the guiding light of midwives and healers. Sometimes Ichal shone brightly and fully, her radiance glowing. Sometimes she pulled her silken rebozo shawl up around her and was partially concealed. Other times she wrapped her shawl completely until not even a glimmer of her lustrous cheek showed as she traveled across the sky. There was a time when Sun secretly admired Ishao and he watched her as much as he could. During her dark times, he stared just to get a glimpse of her. Slowly, she would lower her shawl until her earlobe shone, and then her shoulder. And the more he saw the sun stared at her, the more he stared, the brighter she shone until she drew her shawl up again and covered her shoulder and her cheek 
until she was completely hidden again. In the Mayan land, there are two seasons, a calm one and a stormy one. The storm maker is the rain deity called Chak. And during the calm season with nothing to do, Chak becomes very restless and he will look for anything to stir up. He will have a storm one way or another. Now, uh, when uh, Sun was watching Ichal, Chak went to the Moon Palace to visit with Ichal's guardian, her grandfather. I'm sure you've noticed the way Sun watches Ichal these days, said Chak to grandfather. Surely it is Sun's job to watch over everything, said grandfather. Mm, yes, of course, but the way he looks at her is different. <laughs> his, his rays shoot across the sky like arrows. Arrows of love, I wonder. I wonder. I wonder what would happen if Sun and Ichihau ran away together. And he left grandfather to consider that situation. Without the moon, the oceans would exceed their bounds and there would be flooding. Without the sun, darkness, chaos, it is all unfathomable. As the calm season continued, the sea was like glass and the sky was clear and storm maker Chalk was so bored. He decided to go visit Vulture on Jade Mountain and they spoke of Ichal and her beauty and power and Ichak said, you know, whoever marries Ichal will be king of the sky. He will live a life of luxury. He would have anything, everything he could ever want. And as he left, Vulture could not get that phrase out of his mind. King of the sky. King of the sky. I could be king of the sky. And I wouldn't just have to make do with what others leave behind. I could be king of the sky. And from that day on, he went to visit Ichal every morning at dawn. And he would compliment her. He would say, good morning, jewel of the sky. Or how radiantly you shone last night, beautiful moon goddess. And Sun, who watches over everything, noticed. Now the calm season was drawing to a close and a desperately bored chalk went to visit grandfather one last time. I'm sure you know that Vulture and Sun are rivals for each hall. Oh, I heard, I heard Vulture say he plans to elope with her. And to keep that from happening, Sun is going to kidnap her. Imagine chaos. <laughs> uh, I think. I think I might be able to do something to keep that chaos at bay. When the two of them meet in the morning, I could stir up a little something, churn up things a bit. I could make a little storm to block their way. And he left grandfather with grandfather's gratitude to help keep the world from chaos. Now, whether Vulture truly planned on eloping with Ishal, or whether Sun truly intended to kidnap her, we can never know. But what we do know is that morning, as Vulture glided toward Ishal and Sun was just peeking up over the horizon, Chalk was poised upon the sea, and he knew his days of boredom were over.
He called in his clouds until they darkened the sky, and he called in his winds until they roared, and he started with a little thunder, rumbling at first until it was deafening, and then the lightning started flashing until it was blinding, and he was having such a good time that he didn't even notice that one of his lightning bolts hit Chuck and knocked her into the sea. She was buffeted by the waves, battered by the rocks, but Chuck raged on and until finally he grew tired. And as he took a deep breath and the seas calmed and the skies cleared, it was only then he noticed each child's lifeless body floating on the surface of the water. After the savage storm, Ishal's friends came out to look for her. And they came in ones and twos. They came in tens and twenties until they were 400 strong. Dragonflies. One dragonfly appears delicate and frail, but in truth, they hold great power. They lifted up Ishal from the water and they carried her back to the moon palace. And as grandfather mourned, they surrounded Ishal, they covered her and they hummed. Their iridescent bodies shone like polished jade, like sparkling turquoise, and they hummed. Grandfather thought they were humming their funeral hymns, but in truth, they were singing their life songs. They were filling Ichal with their life force. Imagine grandfather's shock and joy when Ishal began to stir and she rose up until everyone could see her radiance once again. She thanked her dragonfly friends and she carefully rose up and resumed her rightful spot in the sky. She continues to control the tides and the cycles of life. Now we know why the Mayan people say, Nunca subestimes el poder de la libélula. Never underestimate the power of a dragonfly. One dragonfly is steadfast and strong. 400 dragonflies, miracles. And that is the story of Ishaal, Moon Woman, and the dragonflies. And now, Scorpius, the eighth uh, sign of the zodiac. Its astrological dates are um, October 23rd to November 21st. But now the sun is only in Scorpio for a very short period of time, November 23rd until November 29th. It is one of the oldest uh, constellation. It was named about 7,000 years ago by the Babylonians who associated it with their god of war. The Greeks, however, uh, uh, associate the scorpion with the story of Orion. Orion, the great hunter of uh, Greek mythology. Uh, he was a great hunter, but he was also full of pride. And one day he boasted that he could kill any beast on earth. Now, Gia, mother earth, did not care for such talk. In fact, uh, she was enraged by his hubris, and she caused the earth to burst open, a scorpion to come out, and it stung Orion to death. Artemis, who is the goddess of the hunt, who probably had a soft spot for the greatest hunter, uh, appealed to her, or her father, Zeus, to please place Orion in the sky, which Zeus did. However, because of Orion's pride, Zeus also placed the scorpion in the sky. And as a sign of Zeus's uh, ruthless sense of humor, he placed them on opposite sides of the sky. Now, why is this ruthless humor? Because Scorpio rises just before Orion sets. And so it appears that the scorpion is forever chasing the hunter and the hunter is forever running away. Sorry. 
Sagittarius, also known as the Archer, is the ninth zodiac sign in the sky. His neighbors are the zodiac constellations of Scorpio and Capricorn, as well as the constellation of the snake. So this is a very rowdy corner of the sky because all four of these constellations stand ready to strike or sting their enemies. In life, the archer was known as Crotus the centaur, and that means he had the upper body of a man and the hindquarters of a horse. Crotus's mother was the gentle Euphemi. She was the nursemaid to the nine muses, and the nine muses were the guardians and the spirits of the fine arts. On the day that Crotus was born, the nine muses gathered round to help Euphemi in her time of need. And then the nine muses began to laugh when they saw the baby centaur wobbling on his four horse legs and then suddenly jump up and begin to buck and gamble. From this time forth, the nine muses made Crotus their constant companion. So while the nine muses played their enchanting music or they recited their epic tales, Crotus would stomp his feet and clap his hands. And that is why we say that Crotus invented the rhythm in music and the meter in poetry. As he grew, Crotus loved to run wild through the meadows. He had a joy of movement and he re reinvented the recurved bow, which sent his arrows higher and faster than the arrows of anybody else's uh, bows. And when he, uh, when uh, he loved to run wild through the meadows, and though he had this wild side, he could be dangerous, he could be impulsive, but he always tried to remember the nine muses' gentle teachings. And that's why on his head he wears their olive leaf crown, which stands for peace and wisdom. Now, Crotus and the nine muses lived together for many, many years as one family. But as the years rolled by, Crotus grew older and grayer, while the nine muses remained forever young. The nine muses watched with heavy hearts as their beloved companion grew older and weaker and then passed away. And in their grief after Crotus's death, the nine muses begged their father, the almighty god Zeus. They begged Zeus to please set their favored friend up among the stars where he could live forever. And that's where you find Crotus today, as if running through the wild, the wild sky like it's one of his favorite meadows. And in his left hand, he clutches the recurved bow. And in his right hand, he perpetually draws an arrow directly aimed at the heart of Scorpio. I was born in January, so I was asked to tell you about Capricorn, which, as you can see, is a little odd, even for the Greeks, to have a goat with a fish's tail. Well, as you no doubt have gathered, there's a story behind that. First, I should probably tell you that Capricorn is traditionally between December 22nd and January 19th, but now because of the precession of the stars, it's actually January 19th to February 16th, but the goat with a fish's tail. Well, Zeus, you've heard referred to in previous tales, the king of the Greek gods, was not always the king of the Greek gods. His father, Kronos, ruled before him, and Kronos was a tyrant. Kronos, in fact, was terribly afraid of a prophecy that he would be overthrown by one of his children. And so every time a child of his was born, Kronos would swallow the child whole. Now, Zeus, the last of his children, was hidden away by Zeus's mother in a cave in order to prevent Kronos from swallowing Zeus. And that cave had a nanny goat who raised Zeus along with her own two children. So you could say that because of, because of this, Zeus had two kid brothers. 
Now, these, these goats were boon companions. They fought with him. They were his constant companions, but they were mortal. One of them particularly loved to swim, however. And when that kid brother of Zeus's died, Zeus, who by now had become the king of the gods, placed that goat in the sky and gave him a fish's tail so he could swim among the stars. Now, of course, the Greeks were not the only ones who saw patterns and stories in the sky. The Navajo tell a story as well about the constellations in the sky. You see, the gods of the Navajo had just finished making the earth and they made day and they made night. And day, they were very pleased with. It was beautiful. It had the bright golden sun. It had the blue sky. It had clouds in the sky to give it interest and variety. But night, frankly, night was a disappointment. It was black and there was the moon. And that was it. So they sat around the campfire, the Navajo gods, and they discussed what they should do about this. And as they talked, the fire god, the black god, his clothes burned black from head to toe, wearing a black mask with a moon on the middle of his forehead as decoration, walked up to the fire. And around his ankle, he had tied a pouch with little crystals in it. And he walked to the north of the fire and he began to dance and he stamped his foot and crystals from that pouch leapt up onto his knee. And he danced around to the east side of the fire and he stamped his foot again and crystals leapt from his knee to his hip. And then he went to the south side of the fire and he stamped his foot again and they went from his hip to his shoulder. And at last he went to the west side and he stamped his foot and crystals covered his mask and spangled in the firelight. And the other gods looked at this and said, what do you call those beautiful crystals? And he said, I call them stars. And the other gods said, could you perhaps put some of those crystals up in the sky to make it as beautiful as the mask you are wearing? And the fire god smiled and he said, of course. And he took one of the brightest ones and he put it directly north. And then he put very carefully a pattern of stars next to it. And he said, I shall call that circling woman and circling man because they will dance around the North Star. And he put other patterns in the sky, very meticulous. He put the man with his feet spread wide apart. He put the rattlesnake with horns. He put rabbit tracks, many, many patterns in the sky. And the other gods all smiled and laughed and said, how beautiful that is. You have surely perfected the night. Nothing could make this better than it is right now. Thank you so much. But then a latecomer to the fire of the gods, Coyote, the trickster god, the clever god, the mischief maker, he came slinking up to the fire and said, what are you doing? And the other god said, oh, you're far too late. Look, we have finished the sky. Isn't it beautiful? You weren't here for it. So that's a pity. But look what a beautiful job we have done. The sky is done. But Coyote smiled, a coyote grin, and he crept a little closer and a little closer and a little closer to the fire god. And then he leapt forward and grabbed that pouch of stars and he flung it into the sky. And stars went everywhere, covering the sky in great patternless swaths. And he grinned a coyote grin and said, now, now it's finished, except, and he looked in this pouch and there was one little red crystal left and he put that up in the sky and he said, that is the coyote star. And that is why the sky, when you look at it, not only has beautiful, careful patterns, but also beautiful, wild, abandoned chaos of stars. And that story 
is called How Coyote Scattered the Stars. You've heard several stories tonight about the signs of the zodiac individually. This story contains all 12 of the zodiac constellations, including Aries, the Ram, Taurus, the Bull, the Gemini Twins, Cancer, the Crab, Leo, the Lion, Virgo is the Winged Lady, and Libra is the Balance Scales. Scorpio or Scorpion, Sagittarius is the Archer, Capricorn the Goat, Aquarius is the Water Bearer, and Pisces is the Fish. We also have, not part of the constellations, but part of the world is the Sun. Sally, as she is called in many of the Baltic countries where this story comes from. We watch as Sally the Sun begins her day. She slips into fields and orchards. She dances with golden shoes. Her cheeks are rosy as the red apples that she ripens with her radiant light. Sally rides a copper chariot pulled by a hundred horses. Her brilliant hair totally untethered. She wings her way skyward to light the world. When it comes time to rest or set, she drives her cherry to the sea, her gold crown glowing, and she bathes her courses to cool again. She boards her golden boat and glides to her castle to sleep and refresh for the next day. All day long, Sally presses her lips to the skin of those who pray to her. The dead return to her. Sally's gifts to the world are empowering, enriching light. Has it always been so? No. There was a time when Sally went missing. Sally, who had never cried before, found herself locked in a tower. No one knows how it really happened. Some say it was an evil king locked her away. Others say it was an envious queen, envious of her beauty and radiance that locked her in this tower. Still others say it was Sally's own fault for being tempted to look in the tower. The wind came along and slammed the door and spirited away the key. In any case, she is locked in a tower that has no windows, not a crack, and the door itself is a solid slab of night. Even Calvitus, now Calvitus is the blacksmith of heaven, normally working on projects, sparks raining down, building things, notices there's a darkness, there's a coldness. As he works, he hears a noise come rumbling up from below. It's the people shouting, where's our son? Where is Sally? Even the constellations of the Zodiac were working on this. They're circling the world. They're talking, discussing, arguing. What can they do? We have to have a plan. Finally, Aries, the ram, went to Calvitus and says, we have a plan. We need you to build a hammer. Nobody says, a, a hammer? What, I don't need to build a hammer. I'm a blacksmith. I have hammers. No, this hammer will be special. It will be one like you've never seen before. This hammer is going to smash the tower that has locked away our Sally. Ah, Calvita says, she is gone. In a tower, you say? Yes, says Taurus the Bull, a tower. The veins are bulging from his neck. It says, this tower is built from earth to heaven. She's trapped. I give you, Calvitus, strength in your shoulders and arms to build this hammer. The Gemini twins, with their four hands, said, you will need special materials. You will need body and mind. You will need mortality and immortality. You will need all, and you will need nothing. Calvitus uh, said, well, you know, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, but, but 
says cancer the crab, but you have other things to do, right? I'm going to give you the gift of longing. As a baby longs for mother's milk, I give you longing to build this hammer. Leo the lion put his hand on Calvitus' heart. This hammer will bring down the tower in just three blows. Virgo said, my gift to you is judgment and discipline for this project. Libra, always speaking evenly, the halves of you will work together, side by side, the mind and the body, the skill and the imagination. Leave Scorpio laughed. <laughs> All these are essential projects. However, sleep is essential as well. I'm going to give you the gift of long, deep sleep for this project. Sagittarius says, my gift is optimism. I want you not to despair of this responsibility. Capricorn says, I'm going to give you doubt. Just enough doubt to make you flexible, to try and try and then dig your heels in and, and try again. Aquarius, the young haired Aquarius, the young boy with the long hair and an earthen jug full of water. This is water to temper the hammer. Well, Calvitus is clenching his fists and he's looking at each sign of the zodiac and Pisces, the fish, sways gracefully and says, we have given you our gifts. We have come to you because we know your imagination and we know your skill. All was quiet for a few moments. Aquarius then said, we have spoken. There's a rummaging sound as the constellations move around the planet and are lulling the already heavy-eyed Calvitus to sleep. As he awakens, he starts working on the hammer. He merges air and water, fire and iron and imagination. Locked in her tower, Sally, who's never known tears, is now crying. As she's rocking back and forth in despair, but she doesn't know why she is feeling hope within her. Calvitus finishes the hammer and he swings it. One, then two. And with all the consolations of the zodiac in chorus says three. The neck of the tower is broken. It tumbles down in ruin. Sully escapes. She runs. She somersaults. She's headed for the meadows. It's getting light again. People are opening their windows and shutters. The doors, people are coming outside. The hillsides glint with new light. Sully heads to her horses who are prancing and snorting longing to be hooked up to their chariot once again. Off they go, be high in the sky. Solly's riding the queen of the skies once again. Solly cries though. She cries for happiness this time because she's free to ripen apples and give light. She cries also out of sadness though for the apples that didn't get ripe, that rotted in the fields, for the fallen leaves. Solly's tears are like red berries filling the hillsides. Now to this day, when people make pies and tarts, remember Solly's tears. Remember the time in the tower. Remember Calvitus's hammer. Most of all, remember and enjoy the joy of Sally, the light that she gives to refresh us all. As you can tell, we're coming down the home stretch. Aquarius, also known as the water bearer, is the 11th constellation of the Zodiac. 
And it's in a very, what was called the watery part of the sky. Because along with Aquarius was Pisces, the two fishes, the southern fish, the sea goat, and the whale. Now, the ancient Babylonians thought that Aquarius controlled all of these other constellations up in that watery part of the sky. And so they thought that Aquarius was very important. The Egyptians also thought that Aquarius was important because they felt that Aquarius controlled when the Nile would flood, and that had to do with their crops, which were life and death to the Egyptians. Now, the Greeks had a myth in which they said that Zeus, king of the gods, wanted to have a cup bearer, a water bearer, someone who would pour libations for the gods, and he demanded that this libation pourer had to be the best of mortals, had to be the handsomest, the most graceful, and the most loyal. So Zeus's favorite bird, the eagle, flew down to earth, snatched up Ganymede, a youth who was the son of the king of Troy, and brought him up to Mount Olympus. And Ganymede poured libations for the gods with such grace and charm and loyalty that he was rewarded with his own constellation of Aquarius. And so every night, Aquarius pours a shimmering stream of sparkling stars. Pisces. Two fishes swimming in opposite directions is the 12th constellation of the Zodiac, and its traditional dates are February 19th to March 20th. Currently, the sun passes through Pisces between March 12th and April 18th, and the point of intersection between the path of the sun and the celestial equator takes place about March the 20th. Since that intersection marks the vernal equinox, that means the vernal equinox now takes place during Pisces when it used to take place during Aries. That's the technical part of Pisces. The mythological tale of this zodiac sign has to do with Aphrodite and her son Eros, also known as Venus and Cupid. One day, mother and son had to hide in the rushes along the Euphrates River because they were being pursued by the horrible dragon-headed monster named Typhon. When Typhon was almost upon them, two fishes swam up and carried mother and son to safety. This brave deed caused the two fish to be immortalized in the heavens as the zodiac constellation Pisces. Thank you so much for being the wonderful audience that you are. This is our very last story for the evening. There are several things that you need to know for this story to make sense. One, it takes place in an area of Great Britain called the Lincolnshire Cars, and this is not a car dealership. Another thing that you need to know is that there are some creatures in here described as the will of the wikes and they're what we call will of the wisps here in America. And it's something that happens in marshes and boglands where a light seems to blink on and off and they say that they are spirits carrying a lantern. The other thing that you need to know is that this story is chock-a-block full of interesting superstitions. These are not superstitions that we tend to follow, but I hope you'll find them interesting. Long ago, in the Lincolnshire Car area of Great Britain, full of marshes and boglands, it was said that it was death to walk through the boglands on any night when the moon did not shine. For it was then that the boggles and the horrors and the dead things with their staring eyes would come out and they would work their mischief and they would harm anyone who wandered into the boglands. Finally, the moon who had heard so much about what happened in the boglands when she did not shine decided that on one of her dark nights, she would step down into the, into the world and see what was going on for herself. 
And if she could think of something to do to make things better, she would. So the moon took her black velvet cape, fastened it around her neck, threw the hood up over her shining golden hair so that the light did not stream out. And then she stepped down out of the sky and onto the earth. And she began to walk slowly at first through the boglands. The only light showing came from the white light of her tiny little feet. And on and on into the boglands she walked. She began to see the witches riding on their brooms with their great cats. She saw the boggles lurking, the crawling horrors creeping around. She saw the dead things reach up their slimy hands from out of the murky water, and they began to pluck at her cloak. She shivered, but on and on she went. Finally, at just one moment, a stone slipped under her foot. She went forward to grab a hold of a snag to try to steady herself. The snag jumped to life, wrapped itself around her wrists like handcuffs, and she began to shake and to tremble. She tried to get herself free, and she struggled and struggled and struggled, but she could not free her hands. Finally, when she was so tired, she fell forward. But then she heard, help, help. Help me, help me, please, wait, 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 for the love of heaven, wait. And she looked over, and there was a man stumbling through the boglands. And she knew that he was being led astray, away from the path, by two will-o'-the-wikes with their lanterns winking on and off. And she knew that if he were to fall into one of the bog holes there in the boglands, that he would surely die slowly, a horrible death, either drowning or else suffocating as he began to sink into the mud and the slime and it would begin to fill his mouth and lungs and he would perish slowly. And the moon became so sorry and so angry that she struggled some more and could not free her hands, but then she shook her head and flung the hood back off of her shining golden hair. The light streamed up into the sky, and the boggles gave a shriek, and every every evil creature ran for their hidey holes. The man gave a shout of joy, for now he could see where the path was, nearly as clear as day, and he also could see the bog hole that he had very nearly stepped into. And he was so happy he ran, not looking to see where the light was coming from. So the man was safe, but there was the moon, still trapped tight. She could not get herself free, and she fought and fought until she was completely spent. Her head dropped forward again. The hood came back over her shining golden hair, and then it was pitch dark the boggles, the creeping, crawling horrors, the dead things, the witches, they all came creeping out. Oh, moon, not so fine anymore, are you? How are we going to kill our enemy, the moon? And they fought and argued and squabbled and fought and argued and squabbled until one of them noticed that the first lights of day was coming out and they realized that they had no plan to get rid of the moon. So they did the first thing that came to their mind. They shoved the moon down into that nasty, murky water. Then two of the boggles went and got an enormous stone, much like a coffin. They put it on top of the moon to keep her down. Two of the will of the wikes were set to guard her. And so the moon was buried underneath a coffin until someone should come to look for her and who would know where to look. The next night, the folk of the Lincolnshire cars, they put straw in their caps and money in their pockets for that was supposed to bring the new moon, but she didn't come. And she didn't come the next night, nor the next, 
nor the next, nor the next. And soon the creatures from the bogland came roaring and screeching and moaning up to the very houses of the men of the Lincolnshire cars. And their, the misshapen fingernails would scratch against the window panes. And the people inside were so horrified that they kept their fires burning all night because they were afraid that if they let the light of their fires go out, that the dead things and the other creatures would creep up over their threshold and into their very homes themselves. The men of the Lincolnshire cars knew this could not continue. So they went to see the wise woman who lived in the mill. Our beloved moon, we cannot find our beloved moon. Please, can you help us? And the wise woman said, well, I'll take a look. And she looked in the brew pot and she looked in the book and in the mirror, but all was dark. I need more information. Go out and talk to each other. Go, in fact, to the inns. I know you won't need any more prodding from me. Go have a drink at the inns in the daytime and see what you can find out. Come back and tell me and I'll see what I can do. The men went out and they did go to the inns and they sat and they talked. And all of a sudden, a man from the far side of the car said, I reckon I know where the moon is. I was out on the boglands and all of a sudden, just before I fell into a hole, a bright light appeared and that must be the moon. She must be lost out there. The men went back to the wise woman in the mill and they told her what they had found out. And she looked in the brew pot and she looked in the book and the mirror and she said, I can see what you need to do. Go out, but speak not a word. Put a stone in your mouth to stop you. Speak not a word, not one word. Take with you a hazel twig. You are to look for a cross, a coffin, and a candle. And that's where your beloved moon will be. And while you're out, put some straw and salt and a button on your doorstep. And this will help to protect your families while you're looking. So that night, the men put a stone into their mouths, picked up their hazel twigs, and went out into the bogland. They saw the will of the whites. They saw the staring eyes of the dead and the fingers that reached up out of that murky water, up underneath their trouser pants legs that caressed their ankles. And they wanted to cry out in fear, but they daren't. And so they went on and on until they saw a huge stone that looked like a coffin. There were two branches that made a, an eerie cross. And in the middle of that, there burnt a tiny little candle. And they knew that they had found the right place. They knelt down and they said the Lord's Prayer forwards for the cross. But not a word did they speak out loud. Not a word. And then they said it backwards against the boggles and the horrors. And then as one group, they picked up that enormous stone, lifted it up, and for just an instant, they had a glimpse of a beautiful, strange, glowing face. And then the moon shot up into the sky, her bright hair lighting up the night as near as bright as day. And the men were able to travel home safely. And ever since then, the moon has shone her brightest over the Lincolnshire cars, the marshes, and the boglands. For she knows what evil goes on in those places. And she also knows that the Lincolnshire car men, that they came to look for her when she was near dead and buried. And that's called the Buried Moon. Thank you.
there were two more stories that we had hoped to have. One of our members is Marilyn Conley is sick, and we hope that it can be added into the video at a later time. And another member of our group, Larry Bietzky, was telling a story that is recorded, and we hope that that also will be added in the future. We are the Green Man Storytellers. Thank you.